vehicles involved pulled up to a house and stopped. So it turned into a daylight helo assault to an objective. Pretty much every any enemy combatant that we encountered had suicide vests on. Um, so not only were they shooting at us, but they were all prepared to blow themselves up just to kill us. Well, you know, we had we had guys wounded. We had a couple of helo pilots wounded. There, there was just no emotion associated with that at all. And looking back for me, that was like a pivotal point. It was like, why don't I feel anything anymore? Like what's what's wrong with me for lack of a better term that I don't feel anything anymore. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we complete the second segment of our Combat Story with Chris Van Sant, a retired Army infantryman, Ranger, Green Beret, and operator in 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta. We left our first interview with Chris at the height of his career. In the unit, multiple combat rotations and close friends. We pick up in round two where things start to get more difficult and the op tempo, intensity, and constant fighting begin to take a toll. Chris describes how he overcame some very dark days that many can relate to and found new opportunities he never would have imagined. He's gone on to become the chief operating officer at TYR Tactical and is a board member for Tom and Jen Satterley's All Secure Foundation both of which continue to protect those in need. I hope you enjoy this deep dive into combat and recovery from a very humble tier one operator as much as I did. Chris, thanks for coming back for round two. Thanks for having me, Ryan. I appreciate it. I know we're going to get into uh, some of the the deeper, darker sides of, of this line of work, and I thought it would be fitting with what's going on in Afghanistan now to kick off with um, just your your thoughts on what we're seeing and for people who will watch this later um it's very end of august we've effectively pulled out of afghanistan biden gave a big speech today N- not to get political it's more just to set the context and i'm sure like many veterans out there you have thoughts about it and i'm sure you're being asked by everybody you know what you're thinking and i would just turn it over to you chris for some some reflections and how you're seeing this yeah, it's it's uh it's tough. It's a tough situation. Um, you know, I always say, you know, when you work for the Department of Defense, you're uh, you're a tool. Um, <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way. Yeah, I just mean no, it's a good one. You're you're an you're an extension of State Department policy. So the people that we elect and put in office um, make decisions and set policies. Um, and your job is to um, basically perform your duties in accordance with your orders. Uh, and that's what soldiers do. That's what service members do. Um, it's really tough to see. Um, I understand the, I guess the connection and, and how hurt people are by some of the allies that we've, uh, kind of hung out to dry in country. I think it's, it's very sad. Um, not only for the, for the Afghanis that have worked with us, but, you know, for the women and children that we've, for all intents and purposes, provided um, a better standard of living for the last 20 years. Um, I, I don't want to get political, but, you know, actions in haste are never good. Um, I think I said the last time we talked that, you know, you could ask any service member, um, what do you think would happen if we pulled out of Afghanistan? Just like you could have asked any service member, uh, what do you think would happen if we pulled out of Iraq all of a sudden? I think it's a difficult choice. I think um, if I were going to play devil's advocate, I would say that it, it's you're not ever going to make everyone happy as a, an elected official making a choice to leave a combat zone. Um, but but personally, I mean, we stayed in in Germany and in Japan for for decades, um, and that was necessary uh, to ensure that things that had happened in the past never happened again. Um, and I, I personally don't think the right choices were made. I think there's a lot of great Americans that have stepped up to do a lot of good um, in terms of getting AMSITs, um, American citizens out of Afghanistan. I think it's very complex. I think as a, 
as the layman looking at that, I think it's easy to go, oh my God, I can't believe they did this. Or, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. Or why are they leaving all these people? You know, there's a lot of categories of American citizens in Afghanistan. Um, and each one of them uh, kind of comes with a different set of circumstances. So it's, it's very difficult, very complex. Um, it is very sad. Um, but at, at the same time, uh, and I've said this to people, you know, we did give them 20 years of, of living a life that they otherwise wouldn't have had if we didn't have a presence in Afghanistan along with partner nations. So difficult, uncomfortable, uh, sad. Um, but unfortunately it's the state of affairs today. Did you guys work with, uh, how often maybe did you work with some of the, the Afghan forces in your time there? Cause I know yes. that's, that can be a real, uh, sorry, Chris, I was just going to say it for a lot of the folks that was a very real experience for them working alongside your interpreter or the Afghan commandos. They, they spent a lot of time together. Was that the case for you guys? Yeah. I mean, I can't speak to Afghanistan. I spent one rotation over there literally. Um, and then a bunch of time in Iraq and then some time in the Horn of Africa. <clears throat> and that's just the way my cards were dealt. Um, so I didn't have a lot of personal relationships from Afghanistan originally, but I can tell you from Iraq, um, our interpreters, the, the Iraqi people that um, supported us and worked with us and helped us, whether it was an interpreter or whether it was a maintenance person, um, you developed relationships with them. You learned a lot about the country and the people and the culture from them. And you did form personal bonds. Like they were, they were very connected to the mission, to what we were doing, to the people we were trying to help. And that's, significant. Um, I think if the same situation were to present itself with people that I knew in Iraq and I had worked with, um, and I formed relationships with, I would, I would be as angry and as upset as, as people are today. Yeah. I do think one of the better things we're seeing coming out, coming out of this, at least on social media feeds, like you and I have, are these fellow vets who are working their asses off to go and get these people out, like however they can figure out a way to do it. And it's kind of this, almost like this logistical mess that you, you learn to navigate from your time in the military and you can kind of figure out some of the loopholes and getting people through. And it's really cool to see that pan out, um, folks working together again, but it's really neat. I think it's one of the upsides, I think of what we're seeing. It is. There's a lot of capability and a lot of experience out there and there's a lot yeah. of people doing a lot of good. Um, at the same time, there's been a lot of things that have pissed me off. Um, there's, there's people that are in the name of good over there um, and, and posting things to social media. I don't think that is necessary. I don't think that is important. I, uh, frankly, I think that's a detriment to what you're trying to do. Uh, and I get it. They do it under the guise of, I'm trying to get the message out about all that's going on, but there's plenty of that. I mean, <laughs> mainstream media alone, who, who solely supports one side of the equation is pretty balanced on this issue. Um, you know, they're, they're putting facts out there and it's not pretty. Um, so I do have a problem with a lot of people that are over there in the name of help posting things about, you know, their efforts. Um, I think that's one of those things that you do quietly and, and that's the way you're successful at it. And the organizations that are doing it the right way and the people that are doing it the right way are being quiet about it. Yeah. God. And the other point, and we'll dive into your, your story here. I think this is a good segue is just, there's a lot of vets who are trying to process it from the years that they spent there watching this happen and, and what that does to you psychologically, even if you're, you've recovered from that, which I, I think is a good bouncing off point for us. As we left off in part one, we had talked through kind of your progression into the military, into some of your deployments. You're with the unit at the time, and you're kind of living this dream almost that a lot of guys when they're younger as soldiers would kill to have. And so I want to make sure we continue on that path for a bit before we talk about what comes next, which is quite difficult. And I think a lot of people can relate to and would love to hear. So yes. if you could drop us back into one of these more positive combat deployments that you, you saw um, to set the stage for us, maybe. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think where we left off, I was like 
second rotation into Iraq um, post invasion. So we were still chasing deck of cards and um, folks related to the Saddam regime. Um, you know, the, the infrastructure that's required to support uh, even special operations in a country is significant. I think that's something that the American people don't understand. Like, sure, one time we can reach out and touch anybody anywhere in the world uh, because that's what we do and that's who we are. But sustained operations, sustained targeting takes a massive support structure, a massive buildup of military might and power, um, both for security and for logistical support. Um, so as the war went on, you know, it transitioned into different phases. Um, after the invasion, you know, we went to targeting, like I said, deck of cards, folks and Saddam loyalists. And that culminated in the capture of Saddam Hussein in December of, of uh, 2003. Um, I was fortunate to, to be a part of that. Uh, and honestly, you know, we had a party that night and we thought, we're going home, man. We'd like, we mission accomplished, <laughs> not to quote, not to quote George W. Yeah. Bush, but, but, you know, we felt like we did what we were asked to do. Um, but like I said, in the, in the first part of the podcast, you know, in October 31st, Halloween night of 2003, before we'd even captured Saddam, we had seen the influx of foreign fighters into Iraq. And I think politically we had to make a choice of, do we continue to fight them on foreign soil or do we pull back and wait for the next 9-11 style attack or whatever that might look like? Um, and that's kind of where we were left at the end of 2003. Um, so that, you know, led into the next rotation. Uh, you know, Saddam's caught and yeah. what do we do now? Yeah, could I just add, I mean, when you were going out on that op, did you know you were going for him at that time or was it uh, yeah. more happenstance? Yeah. No, 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 no. We've been chasing him for months. So we were, we were mentally and physically exhausted. It was almost a joke in that, you know, here's another one. We called it whack-a-mole. Like, you know, some new lead would pop up and we would chase it because we were really the only force chasing Saddam. There was a lot of conventional mission going on in Iraq, a lot of stability ops and things like that. But we were really the only guys targeting at that point. Um, so it got old. Um, there was a lot of waiting, a lot of chasing. Um, so when it happened, um, you know, the day prior to the Saddam capture, we rolled up a guy named Muhammad Ibrahim al Muslit in Baghdad. And we, he was in an apartment in a duplex basically. And we, we pulled Muslin out and brought him back and we didn't, we didn't know a thing. He didn't look like the guy we were after, but, um, through, you know, successful interrogation, he, he basically said who he was and he was the the golden ticket he was the guy that knew where saddam actually was um so you know about six hours later post interrogation we were woken up told we were going to drive to drive to crit and do the saddam hit and on the way there it was a funny conversation it was it was is this another ridiculous lead and we're chasing our tail again because we've been at it for months or is is this legit <clears throat> and then as we got closer uh, and then we got up there and we sent the guy out with the team to do close target reconnaissance and point out the possible locations where he would be. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk about what if this is it? Like, are, are, are we good? Do we get to go home for a while? Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it was it was a it was an incredible achievement to remove an evil dictator. Um, and we were successful, but uh, it was just another day um, at the end of the day. Um, because we knew things were transitioning to a different mission set. And uh, the reality was we weren't going home. So you said a couple things there that I think, myself included, but I think a lot of people who have never been in that environment would say, you, you mentioned like this was night after night and you guys were exhausted. Where does the exhaustion come from from that? Like what does that op tempo look like at that point in the war? I mean, early on at that point in the war, it was 24 hour ops. So, um, and I think I said this in the, in the first portion briefly, but it was, we have, it was whack-a-mole. It was this thing popped up. We have some intelligence. We need to go now. And, and commanders were hungry, you know, I mean, that comes with the territory, especially early on in a war like that. Yeah. Um, so it was constant. It was, 
we're going to chase this lead. We're going to chase that lead. We haven't, we hadn't really understood what true HVT targeting look like at that point. Um, and what assets you should allocate, um, based on the target. Uh, I think they, they hadn't fully formed that idea. Uh, and it, again, it was the early days. Um, you know, McChrystal took over somewhere in there as the JSOC commander and, and Stan McChrystal was coined with, you need a network to fight a network. Um, and I think he's the first guy that really stepped back and went, okay, this is what's developing on the battle space. Um, how do we best employ our forces to deal with that? Uh, and what's the long-term goal? And, and so, so, yeah, it was a very changing environment. It evolved into a bunch of different things over those first two, three years in Iraq. Yeah. And then just as you mentioned, like you didn't know if it was going to be a dry hole on that particular op. I often wonder for the guys who like went in to get bin Laden, do you feel like, Hey, this is the super bowl or is it, Hey, this is another double header. I don't know if we're going to have a good game or what's happening. Like what was the mindset going into that op? Yeah, we didn't. Uh, I, I, we, I, I, we were still 50, 50 on the Saddam hit. It was a split force. We hit two separate locations at one time. Um, I, I was with the troop that hit the, the cook's house, which was one of two locations that he would be at turned out to be the, his personal chef's farm family farm that, that we ended up finding him on. But, um, when we hit the cook's house, um, it's very rare to see someone projectile vomit out of fear. Uh, I've seen a lot of fear response over the course of my career. Uh, and the lady that night, um, under questioning, basically lost her cookies and uh and we knew something was up um and in in a very short and effective battlefield interrogation by my my troop sergeant major at the time a guy named tom satterley um he asked a couple of really pointed questions about food in their freezer and why they had so much and they rolled over um and ended up pointing out the the actual farm that he was on and then you know a successful assault was conducted after that wow Hey, just what are some other interesting fear responses? If I don't know if it's uh, if it's R rated or what, but like, what are some of these other ones you might see? Well, I yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't want to say anything that offends anyone, but you know, there's a few things that happen. Like fight or flight is the first response when someone thinks they may die. Um, so there's the normal sort of analogy where you're being chased by a dog that's trying to bite you and you run faster than you've ever run in your life. Um, and then there's the non PC version, which is, um, people that think they're going to die, get retard strength, (laughs) (laughs) uh, which is one of the reasons why, um, in spite of all of our combatives training, I never chose to put hands on a person. Um, if I had another option because someone, um, facing what they believe is death, uh, can get very interesting. Um, so I've seen it all. I think all of us have seen it all from vomiting to using the bathroom, to screaming, to fighting, to you name it. But yeah, I think over the course of the years, you see a little bit of everything. Oh, I I am reminded of of Shrek who you and I were talking about just briefly beforehand, how he got his name. I was curious. And he's like, they said I had retard strength. (laughs) So (laughs) So, so I'm, I don't know what he did to do that, but uh, I, who knows? But that, that, that is really funny. Okay. The legend, the legend continues. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. So I, I got to imagine you come out of that hit on Saddam. Just out of curiosity, like, were you the next night, were you back out at it or did you get a couple days? We did that, it. If you can remember. No, we did a hit the next day. Uh, I think one of the photos you posted is, um, the one on the helo that I took daylight off a little bird pod. Um, that's the date on that, which was actually on the photo is December 18th. So that's five days after we caught Saddam. Um, and that particular one was chasing, um, Izad Ibrahim al So Saddam's like number three. Uh, in the chain of command, we chased out Dury forever. I don't think that dude ever got rolled up. Um, he's probably living on a beach somewhere. Uh, he was the bald dude with the mustache that was always on TV. Didn't look like an Iraqi, but, um, but yeah, no, we did a hit. We did a hit literally the next day. Um, and then, and then a couple of days later. So 
we had a party the night we caught Saddam and we, when we finally got back to Baghdad. And, and after that, it turned into, I guess we're not going home. Um, but our, our squad, my squadron rotated out uh, just a couple of weeks after that and handed off to somebody else. But we knew, we knew it wasn't over. We knew we were going to stay in Iraq. Wow. Okay. Fascinating. If, um, if we then fast forward, what are we looking at next for you? How, how much longer in that deployment until you hit your, your follow on? Yeah. Uh, about six months we were, we were 90 to 120 on and then about six months off. So that six months off included some downtime, um, some vacation, hopefully, uh, and then train up and lead up for the next rotation. So I think my next rotation was, uh, summer of 04 and that was post Saddam capture. So we went home in early January of 04 um, and then we were right back there in the summer. Uh, and, and that was a cool trip. Um, that was the first trip of the exchange. Uh, so Stan McChrystal, and not a lot of people know this, but, um, and I think it's okay to talk about, to be honest with you, but Stan McChrystal realized that our operational tempo as a force, um, well, as basically the special operations organizations was getting a little ridiculous. Like I said, we were running 24 hour ops. He needed his chess pieces to be interchangeable. And I I don't say that lightly. Uh, When I say chess pieces, I mean, his his strategic assets, he needed to be able to move around the battlefield without burning the guys out. And he saw that, that what we were doing was unsustainable um, and that we needed to cross pollinate within the tier one assets within us. SOCOM. So that, you know, that would be the, the Navy or dev group, um, SEAL team six and, and, and the unit and Delta force. Um, so he directed an exchange where we gave a team's worth of guys to a deploying, uh, squadron from the Navy and the Navy gave a team's worth of guys to deploying squadron from the army. Um, and the intent was to kind of cross level information in two theaters. So when we left Afghanistan, to do the invasion of Iraq, we handed over to the Navy. So the SEALs took over the Afghanistan mission. Again, something else a lot of people don't know. They took over the Afghanistan mission in right at the tail end of 02. So before we did the invasion of Iraq, the decision was made that the Army was going to do the, the ground invasion of Iraq and that the Navy was going to continue on with HVT missions in Afghanistan. And that's what went down. So now here you are a year into that and he wanted to make sure that we leveled that information. So just in case one unit had to go to one place and one unit had to go to another, um, you had some both tactics, techniques, and procedures that could be discussed as well as uh, what's going on on the battlefield and what the intelligence picture looked like. So that's kind of where we were at that point. How hard was that to break the stove pipes, right? Because I've seen this on the Intel side and it's very difficult. I can't even imagine among those two units, like we're, I, I would assume they're sending their best crew over to you guys. You're sending some, some strong folks over to them, but h- how was it just trying to break through some of the historic stove pipes? Interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, there were there were decades of sort of animosity, right? When you're when you're in nations, two premier assets um, that are always jockeying to do the next thing to to remain relevant for the money and and training that goes into every individual in your organization. I think there was a lot of that. Um, it was very uncomfortable at first. Um, if I were to fast forward without going through all of the uncomfortable bits. Uh, I think it was one of the best decisions that has ever been made by a special operations commander. Um, It leveled the playing field. It reduced the tension between the two organizations. It made us both focus on making each other better. I think both organizations learn from one another. Um, I think there was a disparity in the beginning. uh, And I, I don't, anyone that knows me on either side um, understands why I say that and would get it, but I will tell you that it bought, brought both organizations up to a better standard. Um, and it made us more combat effective as a whole under the SOCOM bubble. So it was a brilliant action that lasted for about 18 months, maybe two years, um, that, uh, 
that I think created a lot of ties and binds that um, a lot of us carried through the next decade. I mean, the guys that the guys that came over with those first sort of joint uh, cross pollinization missions, you know, those were my peers and they were about at the same level at me as me in my organization. So by the time I advanced on years later in my unit in the army, the guys that I ended up doing joint ops with in 2007, 2008 were guys that had done the initial exchange rotations in 2003, 2004. So I had a legacy with those guys. So it was instant rapport. It was instant combat effectiveness and it, and it made us better at joint ops. Was there anything that, that you can recall? I, I don't think there would be anything too sensitive here, but is there anything that you recall that with them coming in that you assumed they would be better at or worse at that later proved to be true or, or maybe kind of dispelled this myth in your mind? You try to get me in trouble, Ryan. I don't know. I don't know, man. I, but even just a good learning uh, aspect. I mean, you're you're dealing with people who have um, these similar, you know, similar desires to be the best, and and have learned in different different areas. I, I wonder what it was that you may have learned from them, I guess, yeah. or shared. Uh, so I'll give you both sides of the equation. So in the early days, um, between the two tier, premier tier one units in the U.S. Um, I will tell you that the army side were, were better marksmen. Um, we had a, we had a better program. We developed shooters better. The second point of that is we developed leaders. Um, and, and I don't mean that there aren't guys on the Navy side that are good leaders. There absolutely are. I mean, the army is built to develop leaders. There is a process, um, until they restarted the 18 x-ray program and some things like that. Uh, on the soft side for the army, you got guys that were experienced and had led small teams, even platoons um, in basic tactics before they got to, uh, to special operations. Um, and that wasn't the case on the Navy side. And that reflected in not, and not necessarily in actions on the objective or, or specific, you know, infantry tactics, um, but mostly in contingency planning, you know, guys on the army side had been there, done that. They'd seen a lot of things and they were good at contingency planning. So when the shit hit the fan, the army guys had, you know, secondary and tertiary plans for this is what we do now. Um, and it, and it made us better at it. Um, the other side of the coin is, you know, the Navy had a whole host of skills that the army didn't, you know, the Navy was familiar with with boat ops, the Navy was familiar with maritime op, maritime ops, you know, brown water, blue water, whatever you're talking about. Um, they were good at that stuff. And that in the joint scenario, you need that in your toolbox to be effective. You've got to have all those choices to accomplish those missions. So um, there were things on both sides that were give and take, but at the end of the day, McChrystal's end state of make yeah. both units more capable and make them more interchange interchangeable was it was achieved. Like he, he, he did exactly what he set out to do. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. And, and you said this was like a really good experience, that deployment for you. What were, what was one or two of those high points that you, you really think back on? Yeah. I mean, the guys that we got were rock stars. Um, they were, they really were, they were, incredible seal operators that got handed kind of a shit sandwich, you know, go hang out with these guys that hate your guts and vice versa and make it work. Um, we, every squadron at the unit did it differently, but we chose to incorporate each of those guys into a different team versus keeping them intact as a team. Um, we felt like that was a better use of their talents and it allowed them to better integrate with us. Uh, the very first guy that we ever had was a rock star. Like he was a solid performer. I, I mean, it was a couple of weeks running with us before, you know, Greg was part of the team and, and you couldn't tell the difference. Um, so we had absolute faith in him. And I think that stood out like, Hey, look, man, this guy's incredibly talented. Like he, he's doing this right now in a really uncomfortable situation. And not only is he good at his job, but he gets along with all of us, which is a hard thing to ask of anybody. Uh, and there were a lot of missions in that first year where things went good, things went bad. 
Um, I personally never, ever had a bad experience. I always trusted them. Like I trusted, you know, the green guys next to me. What, what would go bad when you say that? And it doesn't have to get into anything sensitive here, but what's the kind of thing that could go bad there if you've got just one individual dropped into each of the teams? Uh, the biggest difference is tactics, techniques, and procedures. I mean, TTPs. Um, when we first joined each other, the two units did close quarters battle, did CQB, did room or house or building clearing differently. Um, and when you do something so much and it's so ingrained in how you do business, uh, it's muscle memory. Um, so for us taking the Navy guys that did things a certain way and incorporating them into the way we do business, um, when muscle memory is involved, that's a hard thing to unlearn. So it takes a really solid dude and a solid performer to kind of go, okay, I've been doing this this way for a decade and now these guys do it different and I need to adapt to that. That's a hard thing to do. And I watch guys do that. Um, and it didn't work out in every case, not in, in my particular squadron, but you know, in another squadron, there was an incident that occurred and, it's not a fault of any individual. It's a fault of two separate sets of TTPs that uh, weren't effectively meshed together and accidents happen. So don't, don't let me steer you down the wrong path here, but to somebody, especially a pilot who's just looking down and watching people breach a door, it would seem like if you're clearing a house, there's one way to do it. H how many different ways are there to go in? Like if you looked at an Israeli commando unit, you took dev grew the unit, you know, French team, like, would they all go in in a different way? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. We don't have to get into more. All right. That's fine. That's fine. No, I mean, I, I, in its most basic, in its most basic analogy, um, and I think I'm good here, but some units hit a target from multiple entry points and some units don't. And there's reasons for both of those. Um, to hit a, a building or a facility from multiple entry points takes an incredible amount of skill, training, and discipline on the part of the individuals involved to make sure that you don't have a friendly fire incident. Um, you are trusting in the training and shot selection and shot placement, um, as well as understanding what's in front of, at, and behind a target to do a multiple entry breach. Uh, and that's one of the biggest differences amongst organizations. The, the time and energy and training that it takes to get to the point of being able to come at each other and not have a friendly fire incident is significant. Um, and that's unique to tier one organizations around the world. And it's only a couple of nations that do it really well. If that, I, did I talk around that? No, enough? no, you did because Satterley mentioned it when I interviewed him and he's come up again now. And I know you're close with him and all secure and we'll get there sure. too. Yep. Um, but he mentioned it. And I remember thinking, holy crap, how could you hit a place from multiple sides? Um, and I get it. I was just I think to the layman who don't have to do that over and over and over again, you could say like, oh, you just follow the guy in front of you, right? I don't mean to make light of that. I know it's hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the untrained yeah. person, the untrained person shoots at gunfire or action. So if you think about it in the simplest of terms, like I said in the first podcast, you know, mm -hmm. you asked me about a memorable one and I said, yeah. we, we hit it from the, from the roof down and a ground force was hitting it from the ground up. To do that, you got to really have a lot of faith in the people that you're working with and their shot selection and, and them knowing what a target is before they pull the trigger um, without having issues. I'm just thinking of like Brady and the Bucks now or Pats back in the day, like how many times they run a play to perfection. Like, is that when you guys are back in garrison and you're not training or do you're not like out doing some other training but you're you're working on cqb are you just doing it for hours on end no absolutely i mean there's a box when you go through the operator training course there is a box a clear plexiglass box in the building 
that has all of the brass casings from both 45 and 556, five, you know, what or whatever the weapons of choice are, but the, t- the two things that you go through school training on, it has all of the brass casings piled up in it from a single operator going through the operator training course. And it's two feet wide, two feet deep, and five feet tall. And they, they have a round count, which doesn't matter, and I'm not going to discuss. But the point is, is repetition. It's, it's hours and hours and hours on the range. It's hours and hours and hours of doing CQB. It's hours and hours and hours of working with your teammate. There's a reason that Tiger Woods was better than everybody else. It wasn't be, I mean, yes, it was because he had some physical gifts and he had some talent and he had a, a mental aptitude that was better than most of his peers. But the predominant thing that made him better than everybody else was his work ethic. It was that he spent the time on the driving range to be better than everybody else. And, and that's the stuff that like people forget, like it's, it's the, it's the time invested and the discipline of the individuals involved to be that good at what they do. Yeah. Damn. All right. Let, let's, let's then jump to when things start to get a little bit rocky for you, if you even notice it as it's happening, because I know we'll get to some of the darker side, but I think what many people don't know, and I think probably varies between vets is for some people, it might be a, a single incident and others, it can be a buildup of just tremendous stress over time. Um, when did you start noticing some of this popping up? Yeah, um, it's cumulative, right? So reflection gives you an amazing clarity. <laughs> when you look back on a career years later and you've been through trials, um, it's amazing how obvious things are, but in the time you don't really realize it. So, you know, 2005, um, we went through different evolutions. The, the battlefield evolved, the targets evolved, the missions that we were doing evolved, the TTPs evolved in 2005. Um, I lost, uh, on a rotation that I wasn't on. Um, so, I've, I've said this on other podcasts and, and we don't have to dive into it, but at some point, you know, I was an 11 Bravo. You can go to the army special mission unit as, as any MOS. Um, I wasn't a special forces guy. I wasn't coming out of Ranger regiment even, but I was an, an, an 11 Bravo infantryman. Uh, in 2005, I chose to go to the Q course. Um, I wanted to get my 18 series MOS um, so that if I ever left the organization, I could at least go to a special forces group. I could stay in special forces command. I could stay under the, the SOCOM bubble. Um, and in the time that I chose to do that, uh, a myriad of things happened. I, I lost my best friend. Mike McNulty was killed on a target along with Bob Horgan, another unit legend. Um, uh, a brand new teammate that had stepped into my role as team breacher, um, Steve Langmack, uh, originally a third special forces group guy. Steve was killed on target. Um, and a number of my teammates were shot up or injured, um, albeit not killed in one rotation. And it was the rotation that I chose to miss in 2005. Um, I didn't know it at the time, uh, years later and, and a lot of information and reflection, I've realized, um, what I experienced and what I felt was survivor's remorse, um, for a number of reasons, but, So when I came back from the Q course as a graduate and I, you know, got right back in line, rejoined the team. It was a new team. Then, um, it was myself and a guy that was brought in from another troop and a host of new guys. Um, it was a very different deployment. Um, my mindset was different. Um, the unit had taken a tremendous amount of casualties in 2005. Um, it was the first time me, if I'm honest, I was actually scared to go back. Um, and I had those conversations with my wife at the time um, about, I don't know how many times I can roll the dice and, and still come out on top. Um, so 2005 was the first time that I really kind of caught a glimpse of maybe there's some mental effects from, I don't know what I was at that point, um, six or seven seven combat rotations probably 
Um, and, and, you know, they got progressively more violent as each rotation went on. Um, but you know, we really didn't start losing guys. We had lost guys and, and guys that I've been close to, but we hadn't taken such a, a massive hit like we did in 2005 and, and I was gone. Uh, so in 06, I deployed for the first time back after that, I was only gone for six months, but it felt like an eternity. Um, and the, the mission had changed. The battlefield had changed. The level of violence, frankly, had changed. Um, the way that we targeted was different. The, the enemy we were targeting, was different. Um, I didn't know it then, but I was suffering the effects of post-traumatic stress. I was suffering the effects of TBI. I know now, but you know, I, I had up until that point, and this is only 06, I had, I was an 11 Charlie infantryman started out on a weapons platoon in Ranger battalion, where all I did was shoot mortars, which really loud bang in close proximity to your head. And then in my off time, when we were on the range, I shot Carl Gustav rounds out of the, the goose with the other weapons platoon guys, which is really detrimental to your brain. And then I had parachute related concussions. I had vehicle accident related concussions. And then I progressed onto a special mission unit where I ended up being a team breacher for about three and a half years in combat. So we knew what, um, we knew about explosive weight. We knew what explosive weight could do to your organs. Um, and we built charges appropriate for what we were trying to defeat. And we knew how close we thought we could be to them without causing damage to your internal organs. And I'm talking about lung collapse and heart failure and stuff like that. What we didn't know was that that progressive exposure to concussive blast in close proximity to your brain was rupturing capillaries similar to multiple concussive events that a boxer or an NFL player experiences throughout the course of their career. So you add all of that together. And by 2006, I was in the midst of a lot of traumatic injury and I had absolutely no idea about it. Yeah. So I think when I deployed in 08, when we came back, we had to do a baseline for TBI, which I don't think was happening. Correct me if I'm wrong though, Chris, was that happening when you were deploying in like 05, in 06, I oh. suppose. Right. No, so first, it was because first, of this. First, yeah. First baseline assessments happened in 08. Man. Um, for those, like, I, I don't think I have TBI, but for those who don't like, is there anything noticeable in, like, I've had a concussion before. Does it feel, is there like a lingering effect? How, how do you notice it? Wow. Um, and if we need to table that question, we can for a bit. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's want to table it. All right. We'll hold off on that one. No, I just mean, let, like, let's get there. Um, yeah because it's a very hard thing to describe when it first manifests itself and how you understand that. So I, yeah. Just hold off on it then. Cause I wanted to ask you, as you mentioned, you were, you at the time with your wife, you were saying, I don't know how many times I can roll the dice like this. Yeah. A statement like that seems to indicate you're at least thinking about your mortality. Um, you know, you're not invincible anymore, but you're also saying at the same time, you, you didn't realize maybe how deep it was. Is there anything when you look back, even at that time where you're, you might've seen the early indicators that you give advice to guys now? Um, yeah, it, it's a super weird anomaly, but, um, you, <clears throat> on the one sense, you're cognizant of your own mortality and you're worried about going back because you've lost a lot of friends. Um, and you talk about that with your loved ones and your spouse, if you're lucky, um, at the same time all you want to do is go back. Um, the it's almost like regular everyday life becomes uncomfortable and where you're most comfortable is when you're deployed and looking back on it, like it's what it is, is it's your brain simplifying events. You're putting everything in boxes. And when you're deployed, the box is like this big, it's small. You don't have all these other things tugging at you. You have the ability to turn off the outside world, or at least I did, which it turns out isn't healthy, but 
you, you shut everything else down and you focus on what you're doing and you do it in the name of survivability. You do it in the name of the mission. You do it in the name of your teammates, um, but you shut everything out and you just focus on what you're doing. So it's very simplistic in your mind, but at the same time, it's very detrimental. All you're doing is you're compartmentalizing, you're boxing up all of that emotion, all of that stuff that you don't understand because it doesn't make you feel good and you feel like it pulls at what makes you combat effective. So you just shove it away. Um, and that includes loved ones and friends and family. And, and that's not healthy. That's not how you do it long term. Um, and but we didn't know any of that then. So so yeah, I don't I don't know if I answered your question, but no, you, you did. And I'm wondering like if if you it's more the people who are going to go through this again, if they can pick up on something like that, that's happening. Cause I think somebody externally is going to see it, whether it's a spouse, a, f- a close friend, you know, a battle buddy, whatever is probably going to notice a little difference. How do you get somebody, especially like a door kicker, very driven individual to start thinking about like, Hey, this might be going on in the background. So that's something that we talk about as retirees from the community all the time. It's one of the reasons I'm, in, I'm involved with the all secure charity and some other things. Um, it's really hard. Uh, you're, you're absolutely your, your friends, your close friends, your spouse, your loved ones are going to notice a change in you. Um, I think cultivating the ability to talk about it, to be able to talk about events, to be able to talk about experiences and express them in a non-judgmental situation is critical to success with dealing with that. Um, there are places that your mind goes in fight or flight. Um, and with repeated years of fight or flight that really aren't healthy for any human to withstand. Uh, and I personally, and it, and I'm not, I'm not even qualified to talk about this, but my personal experience is bottling all of that up for years. Like I did is what led to a lot of my issues. Um, I, I, I can't see that discussing it with a professional that understands it along the way, not being beneficial. Like that has to be a good thing. Um, but I don't know how you employ that with a workforce that you ask so much of so often, uh, when strength and integrity and, and frankly, valor is an expectation. I, I, I don't know how you get that workforce to admit issues yeah. uh, in their own psyche. I really don't. It's a problem that a lot of us are focused on. It's one of the reasons that I talk and I say the things that I do, it's just to expose people to that. But I'm not, I'm not trying to fix the active duty workforce. I'm trying to let guys know post-service that it's okay that you feel like this. Um, and there are resources and things out there that can help you. And it's okay to admit that you have issues. Uh, because as, as I've said a thousand times, you earn your man card, like you did your job. Um, and now your job is to figure out how to be healthy for the people that care about you. So Chris, I was, I was wondering if you could start taking us down some of the more pivotal moments as you progress down towards the deep end here. Yeah. So I I guess, you know, 2006, um, we had moved on. It was a new phase of battle. Uh, my troop had been charged with standing up, um, basically a daylight vehicle interdiction cell, uh, out of Balad. So we were, Targeting bad guys, HVTs um, that were part of the foreign fighter network, whether it was training or facilitating transport or whether they were just bad guys doing bad things. But um, uh, so we were working out of Balad and and we were basically using all of the assets available, um, all of the intelligence parameters, so SIGINT, HUMINT, all the other INTs. to locate these individuals and we would pattern a life them. And then, um, when they would get in their cars and drive from a to B, uh, we would launch in helicopters and interdict their vehicle, um, and either kill or capture those individuals. Uh, and there was a particular day, um, 
So this is post anom capture. This is AQ in Iraq. So Al Qaeda in Iraq network days in 2006. So uh, AMZ was in charge of AQ in Iraq. Um, and most of our days were spent targeting AMZ and or, you know, people that were a portion of his network. Uh, and our unit in particular, you know, were responsible with those high value targets related to that network. So we had launched out on a vehicle interdiction, um, which we had had a ton of success doing. Um, it was a very effective means of catching the exact individual that you were after. Um, and uh, we left on a particular day and uh, we had gone through an evolution of shooting rounds in front of the target vehicle to get them to stop, to shooting smoke, to shooting 40 millimeter, to shooting minigun, to trying to shoot rounds through the block of the engine like you see in the movies, um, but a bunch of stuff. Um, and where we had landed was our intelligence was so good that we knew exactly who the people were in the vehicles prior to launch um, through all of those assets. I just happened to be the person that was in the aircraft responsible for stopping the vehicle. Um, so I was responsible for tracking on approach um, and then shooting those initial rounds into the vehicle, stopping the vehicle. And then another aircraft was responsible for taking down the vehicle. Um, but some decisions were made and there were some questions that came from individuals and then chant about why we did what we did. Uh, and when you're a tier one operator and you have a collective discussion about this is what we're going to do and everyone nods North and South, this is what we're going to do. And then you conduct those actions and, and then only to have it questioned. Um, it, it brings a lot of doubt, um, to the individuals involved. And that happened to me. Um, so I, I was supported by the chain of command at the time, but at the end of the day, it was a combat decision. Things happen in combat. I think that's something that the American people don't understand is, is there's a lot of stuff that occurs. There's a lot of emotion that happens on the battlefield that you, you physically, emotionally, analytically cannot describe unless you're in the moment um, with all the things that lead up to that. And and I bared the brunt of that on a particular incident. Um, so then not long after that, we launched on a daylight vehicle interdiction. And uh, it was, um, I'm, you know, it's kind of a famous one. I believe it was called Objective Mayor. But um, we launched out on a vehicle interdiction and the, ha and the vehicles involved um, pulled up to a house and stopped. So it turned into a daylight helo assault to an objective. Um, we approached the target. You know, it's a hasty assault, so the pilots are doing the best that they can with a grid location that they're given based on satellite imagery and target location, and uh, they flew past it. And so I'm screaming the bird, you know, that's the house, that's the house, that's the house, and they turn, um, which unfortunately gives the enemy time to kind of react and be aware of your position. Um, but the hawk, the Black Hawk that I was in flared and, and sat down about the same time that, you know, a number of enemy combatants spewed out of the target. Um, and we assaulted that objective. Uh, pretty much every any enemy combatant that we encountered had suicide vests on. Um, so not only were they shooting at us, but they were all prepared to blow themselves up just to kill us. Um, and they were wearing them, you know, in a remote area, which told us that they were wearing them all the time. So in the event that they weren't they thought they weren't going to be successful in an engagement the option was to blow themselves up and anybody that they could take with them <clears throat> and we had some new guys with us and you know we killed a lot of guys on that target uh and there were two vbids on target which if either one of them had been detonated it would have taken down both of the helos that were in support of that operation the moment that we touched down i mean they were they were that big uh, and we got lucky. We got lucky that the guys ran out of the target building versus holding up and, you know, sending fire our way. We got lucky they didn't net detonate the VBIDs. Um, but I, I remember after that engagement, when it all went down and we're all still alive, and I remember thinking, I'm glad that all those guys are dead. And 
Um, it was the first time that I really felt like that. Like it, it, it didn't matter their story, like nothing mattered. It didn't matter what we were there to do. It was that there were bad guys and we killed them. Um, and that for me was kind of a pivotal moment. It was critical to what we were doing because that particular target led to the targeting of AMZ, um, which turned out to be, you know, a month later or so and wasn't us, but we ended up dropping bombs on the guy and killing him. And, and, you know, it was one more head off the, the Hydra, if you will. But I, I just remember like not feeling any remorse for the objective. Well, you know, we had, we had guys wounded. We had a couple of helo pilots wounded. Um, there, there was just no emotion associated with that at all. And looking back for me, that was like a pivotal point. It was like, why don't I feel anything anymore? Like what's, what's wrong with me for lack of a better term that I don't feel anything anymore. Um, because even amongst terrorists and people will probably get pissed that I say this, but there's a level of respect that goes with combatants. Like you're fighting for your cause. Yep. I'm fighting for mine. Whoever's right. Whoever's wrong there's a level of respect that goes with that. And there's, there's some honor that comes amongst the warriors. And I didn't feel that anymore. Like it was just hate and vitriol and I just wanted them dead. And, and that's a, that's a scary place to be mentally. If you had like rewound to yourself, Oh, two, Oh, three on a similar hit, would you have processed it differently? No doubt. I mean, I mean, during the invasion, um, April 2nd, 2002, we got attacked by, 300 plus Fedayeen fighters uh, out in the middle of the desert. And we lost a guy, Andy Fernandez um, was one of the first casualties of the Iraq war. And I mean, we killed a lot of people that day. And I remember feeling like, okay, well, you know, this is what we were asked to do. We survived it. Like there was remorse for loss on both sides. There was, there was all sorts of emotion associated with it. And then, you know, fast forward to 2006 and now I have none. Um, now I'm proud of a teammate because he got his first kill on a target or, um, you know, things that, you know, uh, early on and, you know, looking back, like that's not really a healthy way to be. Um, and that probably makes people very uncomfortable, but that's what, you know, a decade of war will do to you. And do you start noticing differences in how you approach missions like i don't know your attention to detail maybe you're more you're like hyper focused or is it the opposite how are you seeing this play out as you look back yeah it's definitely hyper focused it wasn't complacent it was yeah. the opposite of that i think you pay more detail i think you get less personal as an individual so instead of learning about your teammates and what makes them tick you're just focused on the next combat operation so training becomes a premium um, and it, it, you know, anybody that's ever led people knows that it's a balance, right? Like you got to understand the individuals in your charge to get the best out of them. You got to know what motivates them, what makes them tick. Um, and when you forget that, um, you lose kind of that human element of what you're doing. And yeah, it definitely changed over the years, um, by the 06 rotation. Uh, you know, I just wanted to go back to war because it was the only thing I felt like I was good at it. And we were good at it. And uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a scary mental state to be in when you feel like all I'm good at is killing bad guys and I can't wait to go back. When for you do you hit what many might call like a breaking point where it's, it's really going sideways? Because I know you, you've alluded to the Horn of Africa, you know, other deployments that come up. D does something happen during the deployments? Is it leaving the unit? When is it where you're, you're kind of like, this is not going right anymore? It was a few things. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I did the Horn of Africa rotation in 07. Um, I was the first army guy back in Somalia since 1993. Um, and we were targeting the training network basically. So what was going on, not to give too much information, but what was going on was they were recruiting folks throughout the Middle East and Africa. They were transporting them um, via planes, trains, automobiles, and boats um, to Somalia because it was a safe location. It was a safe harbor to build training camps and to train those individuals. And then they were putting on boats back through Yemen 
and then infiltrating them back in the Middle East to kill Americans and fight the war on their behalf. Um, so in 07, when I deployed there, um, we, you know, it's a slow rotation when you step outside of the box in the Middle East. We didn't have the assets. We didn't have the bodies. Um, it was a it was a joint effort. So it was a couple of guys from each of the tier one organizations in in, in Department of Defense, and um, and we were successful on on one particular occasion in 07 um, in in killing a lot of those guys and disrupting that network for a couple year period. Um, it was a big deal for me personally because we worked so hard to 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 do it. Um, but at the same time, there were things that occurred during the missions in Somalia, um, in particular, the mission in Bargal, Somalia, where we felt like we're an action arm of a system that isn't really looking out for us um, in that we didn't have the assets, regardless of the information and intelligence that we provided. Um, we got in a situation where if it weren't for the, uh, I guess, ingenuity and combination of skill sets from an Air Force guy, a Navy guy, and an Army guy, we wouldn't have got out of. Um, and we took a lot of casualties, and I made some choices in that 07 mission where if I had said things differently on the radio, um, they might not have turned out the way that they did. And that scared me. Um, when sorry, you, I, I'm so, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but you're saying you made the right call on the radio at that time? I think so. Okay. Um, yeah. And I did it based on years of combat experience and telling the powers that be or the people that are listening on the other side of a SATCOM channel what they needed to hear. Um, if I gave them all of the details, the decisions might have been different. And we found out after the fact that the decisions very well could have been different. Um, we could have got left out there. Uh, and that was the choice of a few individuals, but that's what years of combat does to people. Um, and that was a milestone. So I came home from that rotation on the one hand, incredibly happy that we had accomplished a mission that no one thought we would ever do. Um, to sort of the revelry of the organization about, Hey, you did something outside of the middle East and that's amazing. Um, and then I had neck surgery and I had, <laughs> I had all, all these events from, you know, 11 combat rotations that piled up, uh, at the same time that my mental state was not good. So I had surgery in uh, December of 07 on my neck. Um, we were still in the times of here's your tackle box of meds. Uh, I think we rewarded folks that went, I'm just going to go back to work and suck it up. Um, and I was one of those people. Uh, but in, a, in order to do that, they gave you anything and everything that you wanted. Um, so going into my 08 rotation in, in the Horn of Africa, I was literally addicted to to pain medication. Um, I was on sleep aids and had been for several years. Um, and I was mentally not in a good position to, to deploy. Uh, I just didn't know it. So when you are talking about coming back from that particular deployment, right, you're not in the, for lack of a better term, kind of like the, the prime theater of operations, right? Your horn of Africa, you come back, you've done a lot of good, but you have like a significant near miss. It sounds like where you're lucky to be out, although you have accomplished a lot. Is there any sense for you? Cause I hear this from other vets a lot too. Um, yeah, you're recognized by the unit and those people in uniform, but the, like you're walking around a mall when you come back home, could anybody truly like, does anybody know or care what you had just done? Does that weigh on you at that time or has it for you? I know everybody's different. It, di it didn't for me. Um, it didn't for me in terms of the civilian populace. I, I, I never, uh, which whatever the internet trolls would probably say, well, you're talking about it now. And that's, that's not why I do this. And I hope that we get to that. But 
I never felt like that. I think the hardest thing for me was you dedicate your life to a profession, to an organization, to a group of people. And in particular in the Horn of, Ma- Horn of Africa missions, when I was a, a singleton working in a, in a joint scenario, um, the organization that I worked for doesn't do well with individual accolades. Um, so regardless of how successful you are, you get a lot of people that are very competitive. It's an environment we grew up in and everyone wants to be the guy that does the next thing. And for me, it was very, very hard being singled out because it made you a target within the organization. It's like, why is this guy special? Well, I'm not, I'm not special at all. I'm just a fucking regular dude that got asked at a particular time to do a particular thing. It's just timing. And for me mentally, along with all the other stuff that went with warfare and TBI and all that stuff, that was just really, really detrimental. Like to have people that you know and love and would give your life for turn on you because of where you were at a time and place was really, really hard. And I, and I want to be clear, it wasn't, it wasn't teammates. It wasn't people that knew you well. It, it was a result of a hyper-competitive environment and decades at war that created this scenario of if you're not the guy in the fight, no one cares about you and people are super critical of each other and it sucks. Um, and so one of the things that I try to talk about post-service is, look, man, no one cares anymore. Like you did a job based on your time and place and what you were asked to do. Your, your achievements are significant and the organization you were part of is, is amazing and impressive. But at the end of the day, you're just a human being. And it was a job that you did for a number of years. Like, remember that when you look at people, when you judge people, like they're just doing what they're told to do, which ties it back to the Afghanistan conversation. Like there's so many people judging service members, like shut up. Like you have no idea the sacrifice that an individual has made or those people have made for decades. And then they're just following orders and you're judging them for what they're doing. Like, it's just awful. Yeah. Oh my God. When, uh, and you just mentioned it kind of last time when we were talking in, in round one about, you know, selection never ends and you, you end up coming out of the unit. And I can only imagine what you're talking about now, like, neck surgery, right? Like the physical side, the mental side, the, the, I don't even like the, the gaslighting, whatever it is at the time within the organization. Um, that must, I would assume that must've felt like a nail in the coffin. No, it's, and it's funny, right? Like you, you, I'm a guy that never felt like I belong there. Um, that like most guys, out of that organization, they say that like you, you're, you're in a hypercritical environment where you're always judged. You never feel like you have enough to be there. You give all these years and then God forbid something happens and you leave that and your identity is ripped away from you. When all you ever wanted to do was be a part of that. Like that is a catastrophic mental event. That is a hard thing to overcome. And what I found in post-service is Everybody felt like that. Yeah. Guys that guys that left, guys that didn't leave, guys that retired out of there, they all felt like they never knew when they were going to go to work and swipe their badge and it was going to go, nope, you're fired. Like that's how they all felt. And I get I get that it's necessary for a environment where performance is that much of an optimum. Like you have to be that good to be there. I get it. Where I think we fail is post-career um, is holding on to that knowledge and that experience and using it to inform the next generation of operator. What do you think for, as you look at your journey, I want to make sure we hit on some of these key points. Cause I know you're very involved with all secure. Um, I know a lot of people reach out to you. What are some of the key things in your journey that you try to, to make sure a wider audience hears, or you would like to have a wider audience here? Communication. Um, number one, um, I think the people that matter to you, <clears throat> and, I, and I say that with an asterisk, right? Like you can't, 
there's some things you can't divulge. There's some things you can't say. I think service members understanding of that <clears throat> is weak and limited. I think they don't do enough research into what they can say and what they can't. I think your spouse, your significant other, I think your family understanding the things that you go through is absolutely critical because your career is this big. It's this tiny slice of what you do in, in any profession, your family and your friends and the people that love you are forever. They're the people that are going to push you around in your fucking wheelchair when you can't. And if you don't share things with them, you're going to lose them. Like if I had a message, it would be open up. It would be talk to the people that matter to you. It doesn't have to be a lot. It just has to be a few, but you have to share that stuff because you don't understand the things that are happening to you. The second would be professional help. Don't be afraid. The reason that I joined All Secure, well, there's two really. One is Tom's message and Tom Satterley, who was, a, who was in the Black Hawk Down incident in 1993 as a part of Sea Squadron, and then wrote a book about it. And a lot of people, you know, got upset about him writing a book. And, and to all of them, I say, read it and you won't feel the same. But Tom started, Tom and his wife, Jen, started a foundation called All Secure Foundation. And one of their goals is reducing the stigma of seeking help. Look, you, we didn't know. We had no idea what the results or the impact of years of sustained combat operations would do to people. And their goal is to get people to go, it's okay. It's okay to go, I don't feel right. Or, I, you know, it's different for every person, but it's okay to discuss it. And the second one is they focus on the family unit. Like your spouse, well, I'll back up. The, the divorce rate amongst my former organization is 92%. That is so bad. God. 92%. And, I, and I'm one of those statistics. And I found a person later on in life, thankfully, that, that loves me. But the only reason she loves me, the only reason that she's okay with who I am today is because I was unafraid to share all of the things that I go through, my experience. It doesn't mean that they're going to take them all well. It doesn't mean that they're even going to understand, but it's your job as a human being to seek help for yourself and to try to explain that. So if, if I had a couple of messages, it would be communicate to the people that you love. It would be, be unafraid to communicate. Like what you do is what you do. A job is just a job. A teammate of mine said to me one time along the way, he said, enjoy this while you can, because one day you're going to wake up and it's just going to be a job. And he was absolutely right. I went from thinking it was the coolest thing on the planet and I was the shit and this is amazing to this is just what I do. And this is the expectation. And that's significant. Yeah. And I hope people realize that. And you, you had mentioned, I think the first time you and I spoke, Chris, before we started recording and we were just talking about your progression into kind of like the acquisition um, program management side of the military. And I, I almost wonder if there's something here where I can only imagine what we just talked about, like you having to leave the unit, the mental, physical state you were in and how crappy you felt, but where you are today because of the opportunity it gave you, right? Like you're running, you're a senior leader in the private sector at a cool company as a chief operating officer. And I would imagine largely based on this second path that you had after this. No, no doubt. So uh, it's I'm I'm so glad you asked that. So I got fired from the unit. Um, I got fired from the unit for a poor decision, um, and it, it was the cumulative effects of all that stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was a poor decision that I made, um, and it, it doesn't even matter the details. Uh, I didn't have to leave forever. I could have come back, but. At the time I left the organization and I had to find a job and I found a job in acquisition. Um, so the use of SOC G8, which ended up morphing into first special forces command G8. So I was doing equipment development 
um, and acquisition for all the Green Berets in the Army. At the time, it felt like a death sentence. I thought, this is the worst thing ever. Like, I am good at combat. That's what I do. It's what I'm good at. It's where I'm comfortable. And now they're sentencing, sentencing me to a cubicle in Special Forces Command where I've never worked. And they're telling me that I got to go find the next generation equipment for all of our soft dudes. Uh, what I did was I dove into work because I had nothing else. Um, it was a recovery period for me. Um, there was a suicide attempt um, or near it in there. Um, because my complete identity had been torn away from me and everything I thought I believed in and worked for was gone. Um, and I say that uh, openly, comfortably. I'm good with that. I'm a person that almost took my own life and I'm still here today. And now I'm, I'm going to progress into the conversation. But what I did was I dove into that job. I went, how do I take my experience how do I use that experience to develop the best equipment and to fight as best I can for the survivability of our soft operators on the ground? I was very passionate about it. I was fortunate um, to be surrounded by some good people. I was fortunate to be empowered by a chain of command that allowed us to bring in the right people because we really cared about it. Um, and what it turned into was five years of my life that allowed me to give back to the command, to give back to the people that I came from, to make them either more effective or safer on the battlefield. And at the same time, it gave me an introduction to the defense industry and a skill set that I didn't even know existed, frankly. Um, yeah, it gave, me a, it gave me a tool to put myself out there to do something after the military that didn't involve toting a gun. It's, a, it's just like the serendipity of it is very interesting. And I don't want to pass up, and, and we don't have to go into detail, Chris, but I don't want to pass up the suicide mention that you just shared. And I know in Satterley's book, which I would agree with you, people should read it. They like, should. He is very fortunate. His description of his own near-death moment where his, his current wife, like at, he's just met her at the time, but she calls him when he's in a car about to pull a trigger, you know, like the, the luck of that. And I wonder for you and feel free to take this any direction, but um, for those who have come out on the other end for you, did something intervene? Did you just not go through with it? How did you process it day of day after to move on from that? My own head. Um, so I have two daughters. I have two amazing daughters, um, Taylor and Kate. They're both grown now. Um, but I thought about my children. I thought about my family. I thought about the people that my selfish action affected. Um, and that for me is what got me through it. Um, people ask how you got there. I think I, it, it's, it's twofold. On the one hand, I had an expectation of myself based on the things that I had accomplished in my career. That was um, unachievable. I think I expected myself to be this perfect person and I wasn't. Um, and when negative things happened, it fed that side of me that went, no, you're not. Um, not only are you not, but you're not a good person. Um, and it takes a while to get past that. Um, when your identity is stripped away, you look for anything <clears throat> that will give you hope, I guess. Um, and for me, I reflected on a quote, actually, and I've said this a couple of times, but <clears throat> there's a World War II pilot, and forgive me, I don't remember his name, but it, the, it goes something to the effect of there's winners and losers, and a loser is just a, a winner, or, or sorry, a winner, uh, I'm still going to mess it up. There's winners and losers, a loser 
is just a winner that tried one more time. And I love that because it's a reflection of my life. It doesn't matter how many times you get beat down, you, you put your boots on, you pull your pants up and you go do the next thing. And if you keep doing that, if you do it enough, you learn a behavior of not making mistakes. It's what do I have to do to not get in this situation? Not be here again. Yeah. Yeah. And then if I do, okay, well, how do I recover from that? And if you do that enough times, you learn how to just be successful. And I got lucky. I got lucky in the people that I met. I got lucky in the leaders that cared about me. I got lucky in the people that took a, that made a decision to go, I'm going to, I'm going to put myself out there for this particular person. And I'm going to hope that he either proves me right or proves me wrong, but whatever it was. And I owed it to all of them to do that for myself and then to provide that for other people. Like it's, it's so sad to me, the number of people that take their own lives. Like, I don't know, I guess I was lucky in that I found something and thought about my kids and my family when I got to my particular situation. But now when I look back on it, it's, it's, it's almost like it's part of who I am. It's like another school that I went through, like, okay, the, all this stuff happened, all this stuff added up to who I was, all this stuff added up to how I felt. And now I've overcome that. Okay. Now, where do I go next? What do I do next? How do I affect people next? Um, and it's, it's the reason that I do podcasts. It's, it's that I hope that people look at you like a regular person and you push yourself and you achieve something that you never thought you could, but you did. And then it all got torn away from you. So you should have just crumbled under the fold, but you didn't. You went, okay, how did I get here? What did I do? How do I get past this next thing? How do I keep going? And it makes you a better person in the long run. And I mean, all of that stuff, I wouldn't change any of it, Ryan. I wouldn't change a single thing that's happened because I feel like the person that I am today is a reflection of all of those experiences. I feel like it makes me view the world better. I feel like it makes me love people better. I feel like it makes me a better human being now. And it would be a crime if I didn't try and share that with other people. And that's why I do what I do. And you graciously gave us a, a two-part interview here because I, I really wanted us to spend a lot of time on this aspect because I know this is why you do podcasts. So I, I am grateful for this and I've already taken a lot of time. I will get you out of here soon. I think one key thing that is coming to mind with Afghanistan right now, with all the work you've done with All Secure and talking to families, is there anything, because I think a lot of folks who listen to this are not veterans. They're just interested in, in your experiences. So for a civilian out there who's going to interact at work, um, you know, through a family gathering with a veteran who is watching Afghanistan unfold now and who might be dealing with this, is there any advice you might give them on how to have these discussions constructively or how to engage with the vet? Yeah, I think, I hope, I mean, the key is don't be judgmental. Um, however you do that with your person, I think it's imperative that they understand that you're not going to judge them based on the things that they say. Um, there are, Experiences in combat bring out unique traits in an individual. There are experiences, there are things that happen to you that regular people don't go through and can't comprehend. So as a civilian talking to a service member, I think it's important to know that you don't have the frame of reference to understand what they've been through unless you give them the platform with which to represent that. So give them an opportunity to speak. Don't make them feel judged. Um, support what you support. There's a thousand and one charities out there, some good, some bad, frankly. Um, be judicious, judicious in what you support. Uh, do your homework. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's a tough thing, man. Yeah. I, Especially right now. It's really tough. And it's Tom Saturday and I talk about it all the time with all secure. Like people don't, they don't get it. Like they don't get why it's important to us. Um, and it's because they haven't lived it. So it's a hard thing to explain. Uh, and then at the same time, you want to tell them, 
pay attention. Like, don't just, there's a, there's also a lot of negative examples of people giving money to things blindly. And I don't think that's the right answer either. So support veterans that, you know, support charities of veterans that, you know, like use your network to vet specific organizations like veterans don't by and large. And I'm, you know, there's good apples and bad apples, but by and large, People that get involved with things on the veteran side don't do it unless they really believe and understand what they're doing. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm involved with All Secure. Yeah. So just, I want to ask a question that I teed up last time after we, we wrapped up to end us on a slightly lighter note. When I was looking at your Instagram page, it said you're one half of the Chris and Robin adventure. And Absolutely. I really like, I really like the way you shared this with me after we stopped recording last time, especially in the context of finding like something more positive in life. So I was wondering if I could just give you the floor for a minute to tell us about what the, the Chris and Robin adventure is. Amen. My wife is one of the greatest human beings on the planet. She met me shortly after, as we talked about, one of the lowest points of my life. Uh, I had a choice with her, Ryan. It was fake the funk. And hope that she doesn't leave me or be honest with her about my struggles and hope that I can say enough things to make her understand. <laughs> you said a high note. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> Sorry. But I chose the latter. I said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to give her enough information to try to understand who I am. And she did. And what I found in that was a partner that not only got what I was going through, but understood what it took to get me out of it. Um, and we pursue passions that make us whole, that give us a healthy environment to think and learn and understand the things that we go through as human beings. Um, and furthermore, she supports and is a part of things that we're doing to change the veteran community. And I think that's incredible. Hey, I'm good. <laughs> no, no, I know. I mean, like we started round one. I didn't realize it at the time, but like you talking about the two of you, um, and and the outdoor activities, right? Like the oh, God, yeah. and the seven like, summits, and like that's all part of this bucket list, if you will. Right? That's the adventure. And it, it, if I had a lesson for people, it's share what you're passionate about. Talk to your person, talk to your significant other, talk to your family, whatever that is, your brother, your sister, whoever that person is that motivates you to get through that next day, share that stuff with them. Um, because sometimes they will find it as inspiring and amazing as you do. Um, and what it will create is a relationship that cultivates healthiness and, and positive mental activity for the rest of your life. So like talk, talk, share, get it out there. Don't be afraid to do it. It doesn't matter what you did. doesn't matter who you are. Talk about that shit because it'll make your life better. So, and it's funny. My wife uh, has our three boys like probably at gunpoint right now, not saying anything. It's a school night, but like this, she knows this is my passion and there's no heartache given. It's always like, how can we make sure that we get this done? Cause she knows I, I just enjoy talking to people like you. And I guess on the adventure path, this is the bucket list for you two, right? You and, and, and your wife. What oh yeah. Is, what is on this list? Like what oh, is it that's, that's the target for you guys? There's, we literally have a, what we call a red check book where anytime either one of us comes up with some new thing that we need to go do. And it's as simple as entering a hot dog eating contest. It's as complex as summit Mount Everest. But if the two of us agree that it goes on the red checklist, it gets written in the book. And when we do something off the book, we have a, literally a giant felt red check. And anybody that follows me on Instagram knows that this happens. And we take a photo of whatever that event is. So the next thing on our bucket list is to summit Aconcagua in January. So the tallest mountain in South America, one of the seven summits, um, which is on my list, like we talked about. Yep. Um, but yeah, we check things off as regularly as we can. And honestly, even we're guilty of not reminding each other all the time of, we need to get back on the red checklist. Um, so to everybody that's out there, 
make a red checklist and uh, always make sure you pay attention to it because life's really short. That is awesome. Okay. Two questions I ask everybody. You already answered one of them, you bastard. But uh, one is, uh, is there something that you carried with you into combat that had sentimental value for you that you always wanted to have with you? Somebody gave it to you or you picked it up along the way? Nothing. There's yes, always a handful of you guys. There's always a handful. Always. That's a terrible answer. I got nothing. No. Hey, a lot of guys are like, of course not. I'm, of course I didn't carry anything with me. And then there are other guys who are like, well, I got this flag. I got this poem that my dad gave me. All right. Um, and then the other one that I, I asked, and you, you actually said it about 10 minutes ago, but especially with you from the beginning through the heartache to the suicide attempt, like, would you go back and do it all again? I would do it all again in a heartbeat. Yeah. Everything that has happened to me, every choice that I've made, every choice that I haven't made is a part of who I am today. It shapes how I view the world. It shapes why I do the things that I do now. Um, I think a lot of people question that stuff, particularly I come from a community where people don't talk. Um, and, and Tom and I talk about this a lot. Uh, you know, you know, you're going to take some flack when you're the, one of the first people that actually steps out and does that stuff. And I've, failed enough and made enough mistakes. And I'm completely unafraid of exposing myself and putting that out there in the hopes that guys have, that have only done everything right thinks that it's okay. Um, so I will continue to do that. I wouldn't change a thing um, because they led me to where I am, who I am um, and who I'm with today. Appreciate the time, Chris. Um, is there anything else that we didn't touch on here? You want to make sure people know that you're working on or what you're doing? No, I, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I work for, for a tier tactical T Y R tactical.com. Um, tier is a, one of the premier body armor and equipment companies in the country. Um, we do a lot of great stuff. So if you know anybody that needs anything or any help or, or, or a level of protection, we're there to do that. Uh, and the second one is the All Secure Foundation. Tom and Jen Satterley are doing a great job focusing on something different that a lot of veteran charitable organizations don't, and it's the family unit. It's it's making sure that we pay attention to not just the the veteran, but the veteran spouse, be it man, woman, whatever it is. But um, the family unit is absolutely critical in healing. It's absolutely critical in life success. Um, and I hope people go check them out and support that organization. Second stat, it, it does so much good. You just see it on social media and what they're working on. It's really a, just a positive experience. And I think um, Tom put it correctly. Jen is kind of like a veteran whisperer herself and can connect with so many of these people who so many cannot. So it's it's worth the, the time and effort. Um, thank you very much, Chris, for your time. Uh, it's been a blast. You could sit here for hours, but I, I'm going to let you get back to your life and the red checkbook. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate you having me on and great interview, man. You're, you're a great host. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Take care, Chris. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. People often write to me with incredible stories and suggestions for interviews. If you want to share a combat story of your own or from someone you served with, record yourself for up to five minutes and email it to ryan at combatstory.com. I'll select some of these stories and feature them at the end of our episodes. Thanks for listening. Stay safe.